Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Fire Up Florida. And I couldn't be happier to be joined by my longtime colleague, friend, brother, you name it, Larry Bluestein. And welcome to the broadcast, Larry. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Good environment here. Our last uh, hurricane home game of the season. Uh, great, great, uh, great surroundings. Yeah, you talk about a history that the two of us have. My goodness, it only dates back, what, 40 years? Is that all? Yeah, and, and all sports, too, from boxing to baseball to football. And I, you could tell, I'm sure you could tell a lot of stories. I always remember uh, you and Tommy Lasorda, uh, you and Howard Schnellenberg, some of the yeah, some of the great things. But, yeah, we've been, uh, you know, together for a, a long time, known each other, and respect, mutual respect, and uh, I'm so happy to be with you. Well, you know, I got to tell you, everybody talks about this version of the Miami Marlins, the MLB version. But once upon a time, there was another Miami Marlins, and that was in the Florida State League. Larry was a part of it, along with Sonny Hirsch. Yeah. Uh, let's talk, let our viewers know a little about the Miami Marlins of the Florida State League, because that was not easy, putting on that production many years ago over at the Miami Stadium. Right. Well, I started uh, as a fan back in 1956. So that kind of dates me a little bit as a little kid. And my dad and mom used to go to all the games. And then when they become, that was AAA. And when they became the Class A team with the Philadelphia Phillies organization back in 1962, uh, we were still young and we went and you had guys like Pat Williams who was the uh, GM of the uh, Orlando Magic who was a catcher and Ferguson Jenkins and Alex Johnson and those type of guys and then it kind of morphed uh, back into the 67 season when the Phillies uh, were supplanted in Miami by the Orioles and that's when they started getting a lot of uh, a lot of talent. I remember back in the 67 season uh, that Don Baylor and uh, Jim Palmer both did their rehab down in, in South Florida, but it was a lot of fun. And I went from uh, being a fan uh, to a bat and ball, bat boy and a ball boy, to a scoreboard operator, to the assistant general manager. I had an opportunity to do uh, the public address for spring training, uh, you know, as well as the uh, Miami Orioles and uh, Miami Marlins. And uh, yeah, so and you and I met, you used to cover the games at Fort Lauderdale for the Fort Lauderdale Yankees. And, yeah. When we would come up there, it was a lot of fun, and uh, you know I respected your knowledge, and I know you were a baseball guy from the beginning, and I knew always remember you and you and I talked about Detroit, and yeah. but yeah, I remember all that stuff, and then we then we both uh, worked together with the Hallandale Digest. My uncle uh, Peter Bluston and his uh, son and his daughters uh, ran the ran the operation, and I joined in there, and I wrote at first, and then I became an editor. So it kind of brings you up to that portion of it and uh, but uh, I've been around I'm very fortunate to uh, have covered high school football in the state since I was in high school in 1970 so it's been 52 years and, uh, and I still do it and I really enjoy it and but that that doesn't preclude that I don't go to see the Miami Marlins and the Dolphins and the hockey so I I get an opportunity I mean, we're, we're blessed to be in, a, in an area like this where there's great weather all year round plus you got all those sports you know, one of the guys that I've always loved working with outside of you, but I remember we're talking folks in the 80s, okay, was a guy by the name of Sonny Hirsch. Yeah. Sonny Hirsch to me, I remember a time when we were over at Fort Lauderdale Stadium and we had a double header that got in in the middle of the night, like one or two o'clock. But then the Fort Lauderdale Yankees ran out of food. But you and I and Sonny the whole night were talking baseball nonstop. Right. And to me, that was, I mean, you and I have had a lot of great memories all together anyways. But that one, I have to admit, Larry, really tops of knowing that you and I and Sunday would be there talking baseball, middle yeah. of the night, yeah. rainy, yeah. doubleheader, Fort well, Lauderdale, Yankees, Miami, Marlins, my night. goodness. Well, I grew up with Sonny Hirsch. I grew up listening to him on radio. He was iconic, and uh, he's a guy that I he kind of took me under his wing when I was uh, like 15 years old. and. Uh, you know, I started working in radio with him at uh, WKAT, and he used to have us on all the time. But our respect is when we were kids, we used to call Sonny up and try to get things past him, like we would make up names, and he would know that they never existed. So I said, you know what, that's somebody that uh, has his stuff together, and it was fun uh, because Sonny knew his baseball. I learned so much from him. God rest his soul, he was probably as talented as anybody that's ever worked in this market. 
uh, from you know broadcasting games all the way to doing talk shows and uh, you know he was the general manager of the Miami Marlins I worked with him and and Ra Ralph Moorcraft who was an NFL referee for 25 years so yeah I was and that night you and I were that you were talking about we would bring up games and people and uh, and I enjoyed that you know and, and that's when I was doing the public address uh, for the spring training I had such an opportunity to meet everybody from like Pete Rose and you know because the, the Orioles all used to uh, hang out you know they would uh, host these teams and uh, you know Texas Rangers and all these teams so I had, I had a really exciting upbringing and then I got a you know well I'm talking about I just got to credit my dad because it wasn't for my dad he's the one that exposed us to all this stuff he took us to high school games back in the early 60s uh, my dad uh, was a, a baseball fanatic. Uh, he and my sister had Dolphin season tickets from 66 on, and uh, so it was really nice. Well, you know, it's funny. I, Candy and I spent Thanksgiving with my dad. My dad got me into sports as a kid, and of course I played baseball myself. My favorite sport for six years, sure. played hockey for one year and basketball for one, but baseball has always been me. Right. You know, I love being catcher. I like being able to control the narrative behind the plate, manipulate the umpires, take mound visits. I did every psychological trick on an umpire and a pitcher and anybody getting into the batter's heads. So when you talk about the passion of baseball, you know, and then of course the other sports as well. But when you have incredible fathers like we have, and then you get into sports, sure. do, do you think your dad ever thought you would ever become a broadcaster or a member of the media growing up as a kid? You know, you always talk about playing it, but here you and I, knowing that maybe we didn't have the athletic right. ability to do it, but boy, we can certainly talk about sports on levels like no other talk, right, and whatnot. Right. Well, it, it's a good thing that you bring up that because my dad always had, because my dad played. My dad played with the Giants organization, so he was one of those guys that, you know, who always thought, you know, that I would follow in his footsteps. And But he kind of saw well, at a young age that I, when I would, uh, uh, when he would put out the sports section and I would read it cover to cover and I could probably tell you, you know, every batting average, where people were from. So, uh, you know, I'll tell you, Scott, it, having an influence like him, very intelligent guy, uh, you know, who, who skipped from the 8th to the 10th grade and then all of a sudden he quit school after the 10th grade to, to play ball and to do all those things. My, uh, yeah, great influence and I'm sure your father the same way. Oh, my dad was incredible. I mean, in fact, we t here we are in a Miami Dolphin Stadium. But I'll never forget 1973 that when my grandfather died of lung cancer, my minor league team went undefeated going 21-0. and Yeah, it was unbelievable. It was surreal. And I, that was my first year catching. And here I am in a Miami Dolphins venue, the only franchise in NFL history that's ever gone undefeated. So it's just yeah, good kind of ironic. Yeah, 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 isn't it good karma there? Yeah. So let's talk about Sonny Herschel a little bit more for a lot of people that don't know about him. Sonny Hurts was a big University of Miami guy in addition to the Marlins. Yeah. Tell me how much he meant on the U community. Well, uh, you know, you're, right now, Joe Zagaki, who's been the announcer for a number of years, came up under Sonny. He watched him. He was his color man for years and years and years. Sonny was a huge influence. And uh, uh, as far as his knowledge, it was crazy. Back through the 1950s into the 60s, he was a voice of the University of Miami. He had basketball and football and baseball, and especially before, a lot of people don't know, but you know they know Miami basketball now with Coach L. And uh, but Miami quit basketball in 1971 uh, for almost uh, 20 years uh, into the late 80s. And uh, but uh, Sonny was just a great, and then Sonny got more into baseball uh, after that. But as far as the voice of the University of Miami, I, I don't think there's been a better announcer, intelligent, uh, very you know he's he's called some of the great games in Miami history. Uh, you know, the Orange Bowl game where they beat Nebraska. So, yeah, great influence. And like I said, versatile, uh, knew all the sports. And that's, you know, that's a little thing to tell people, young kids who are watching this today, if you have aspirations to be a broadcaster, do it all. Because if you could, the more you do, the less chance people have will get, to get rid of you. So that's that's what he told me, and at a young age. So that's why you know I I did my first radio talk show in, in the Miami Market when I was 15 years old, right. and it was by happenstance. And the uh, the uh, station we were working for covered the Atlanta Braves, 
and at the time uh, they, they had a double header against the uh, Cincinnati Reds and uh, uh, Sonny's mom called me up and says I'd like to see you come in could you come in for a little while start the game and then you can leave because there's Sonny's under the weather so I went there and Scott I'll tell you what it was the longest day of my life the games got rained out so I had to do seven hours of sports talk my first time ever from 12 to 7 I, ha I call, remember, there was, this was the day where they didn't have cell phones and all that. Well, you know, and then they didn't have computers. And so what I had to do is I had to keep calling my friends and tell them to keep calling the show. Because okay. I said, you know, because it was just, you know, but then, and then, I mean, let me tell you something, it was a long time. You could, there's only so many NFL scores you could read, so many Major League Baseball scores you could read. Then the fun part of it all is, you know, finishing up the day and going to have my mother pick me up and uh, I, thinking, you know, oh, what a terrible job I did. I was on for all those hours, and I said, that lady will never, the lady that owned the station, I said, she's never going to work here ever again. So next day, come home from school on a Monday, and my mom says, uh, this is Katzentine, who owned the station, called, and I said, oh my gosh, she's going to kill me. So I called her up, and she offered me a job on the weekend. So I was 15 to 16 years old doing a, a talk show in a major place like South Florida, and uh, really never stopped. I went from there, I went to college, came back and uh, worked at WIOD, worked at WINZ, uh, all the stations in South Florida, so I was very fortunate. You know what's amazing about hearing this, Larry? I got into it when I was 17 years old, George Eichhorn, I know you heard yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, got my first job as producer at WXYZ Radio for Sports Talk, and I followed George through a lot of the endeavors that we did. But get this, I had to do a a sports talk show from six to midnight on Saturdays. Well, then you know. You oh, know I mean, let saying. me tell you what, is, what you have to do to fill content. You had the AP well, wire you services. Yeah, you had to rip the wire off. You oh, had to rip yeah. the ticker off. And, yeah. Forget yeah, this yeah, internet yeah, stuff, yeah, man. Yeah, we had to talk. We had the AP. We had to go ahead and use and that remember, paper trail. And remember this: the great thing is, is there were no afternoon newspapers. Uh, there right. were no, there were no cable. Right. So everything that you would give people, especially like when I did a show on a, a late night, they wouldn't know a score from the West Coast till the next day. Right. So that you know, so the, that's the advent now, and that's why probably sports talk radio is not as uh, more emphasized than it is. I mean, you, right. you have it, but most of them, have, as you see, it's more of a variety show. Well, you know, they'll have guests from different like entertainment and news. We did pure talk shows. Okay. No, sports I remember. talk shows that we did were just, and that's what I say. You know, I, I listen to some of the sports shows now here, everywhere, and I'm thinking these people may not have been able to do the shows back then because you had to have this crazy knowledge. And right. the thing that I learned, and I remember when I first met my wife and she came to the shows with me, she kept saying the one thing she kept telling everybody is, he goes to the damn show and he doesn't have a paper, he doesn't have a pencil because it's all up here. Right. And, you know, if you don't know it, you know, nowadays you just put it on the, you know, everybody Googles everything. And uh, see, and that's, that's why, Scott, I, I feel very fortunate that I've lived in those two eras. You know, right. I mean, and, and so I appreciate, you know, the way it used to be, you know, typewriters. Right. And I appreciate the, uh, I remember the little balls on the selectric, selectric typewriter and, yeah. and all those things. So I, you know, that's the one thing that I, because a lot of people today don't appreciate that because they didn't go through it. And I went through every phase of it. And to me, the reason I go so many places, and I'll see up almost 100 parts of 100 high school games a year, is because I learned that way. Right. Most people stay home watching on video, watch the streaming and all that, but I go. And that's the one thing is when, right. so I feel that those principles, and not just baseball, football, but all the sports, you know, I go to, I'll go to, maybe 20, 25 Marlin games a year, and even though my schedule is hectic, but I usually pick out a Sunday and a, maybe a couple of right. games during the week because there are less crowds and I enjoy it, and I do, you know, I mean, it's because I waited, you know, unlike a lot of people who just moved here, I waited all those years for Major League Baseball right. to come. We had spring training, but it wasn't the same. So I had an opportunity when they first had it, I, we, I covered the Miami Marlins, or the Florida Marlins right. when they first right. opened for the first six years, diligently. I mean, I went to almost every single home game uh, and because I was just, I was just so proud that we, we had an opportunity to have that, you know, being a sports town. I grew up, when I grew up in South Florida, we had 
all we had was minor league baseball, the University of Miami. But then we got the we got the Floridians who were an ABA basketball team, which was great. I mean, Julius Irving played in it, and, and then we, uh, you know, and then all of a sudden we got baseball, and then we got, you know, we had football in '66 when the uh, when the Dolphins came. But we were a community, and we still are in a lot of ways, where people would come from the north and just kind of warm up, you know. Right. So, but uh, it's still like that. Now there's more of a base. Right. I'll never forget the time when your cousin Danny went out there and had me on an assignment where I collected five, six different experts, and we talked about could my, South Florida support Major League Baseball. That was a challenging, assi challenging assignment, but I, it was interesting to get the different opinions on it. So I can subsequently understand why you had to keep professional baseball alive in Miami, regardless of how paltry the crowds were. That way it looks like Miami had a team and rather than just simply give it up. Well, it was a gateway to the Caribbean. Right. So it was closer. Atlanta had been their closest before, but now it's a gateway in the Caribbean. Miami never real, I mean, all these people were dreamers, but I always knew this is an event town. Miami will draw for the World Series. They'll draw for a Yankee game, but they'll never draw consistently. They're one of the worst, them in Tampa are one of the worst drawing, you know, two worst drawing franchises because it's an event town. So what you have to do is you have to suck it up and that's what they've done and realize that the Latin market will go to the games and they'll support Miami, but to a point where there's only like eight, ten thousand, twelve thousand 12,000 fans right. for a Houston game in the middle or, a, you know, or Arizona Diamondback game on a Wednesday or a Tuesday night. So, but yeah, that and the Dolphins caught on real quick. Uh, the Hurricanes, we used to go to the Hurricane games when they played on Friday nights. They played on Friday nights. It was stupid, but they did because, and they went directly against the high schools, and it was crazy, but they did, and we saw some great games. You know, I saw Miami beat the University of Texas when Miami was unranked, and Texas was three in the nation. I saw them beat USC here on uh, 1966 without O.J. Simpson. He wasn't there, but, uh, but I remember the years uh, that Miami would draw. Crap. I mean, you know, they would draw up to 14,000. Uh, you know, even for the Florida games, they wouldn't draw very much. It's, right. it's, it's evolved. All right, so let's talk about the Marlins. They obviously tore the orange hole down to accommodate the new stadium. I think the results have been a little underwhelming on the attendance side for sure. And you being a lifelong South Florida guy anyways, do you feel that they got it wrong with the location? to put it over on the old Orange Wall site because, you know, it, with all due respect, I think you're lacking the access of Palm Beach, Broward, and Dade County where you have it in an area where, you know, you go to an isolated area, like you said, you're going to a game and not the activity around it. Yeah, well, they started it here. You gotta remember, they started at this stadium right. uh, for a number of years before, you know, 2014 when they moved in, or 12, 2012 when they moved into the new facility. And, you know what, I, I understand what you're saying, but this is sort of an area that doesn't matter where you live. It really doesn't, really? because they're not gonna get a whole lot more people if they put it up on this area. They didn't when they played here, and this is as close to Broward, Palm Beach, access to the Turnpike and the 95, just about three miles away. So, um, I, I think it came down to cost, Scott, because you know, they, got, they had that land, and they figured, you know what, you know, especially in the little that area. I mean, it's not a lot of that stuff is. You know, I mean, it's, there's not a lot of land in South Florida anymore, as David Beckham uh, kind of found out with him trying to build a stadium along the water. You know, for his soccer. And uh, but I mean, I understand where you're getting, and there's a lot of purists that are still upset that the Orange Bowl was ever taken down. Right. But it was dilapidated. It was outdated. Um, I had an opportunity to go to Notre Dame recently, and, and um, I saw. I remember how long that stadium has been. But you update. See, and that's what Miami failed to do. They could have saved billions, millions, and millions of dollars by just updating the Orange Bowl. You know, uh, you know, adding more uh, restrooms and wider restrooms, concession stands. Maybe even putting a, a half a dome like they've done here on it. You know, a little just to keep the fans. Uh, you know. But they thought uh, otherwise. Uh, listen, it's a nice little facility that the Marlins play in, retractable roof. I think that if you're a, a parent and you're trying to introduce your kids to the game, it's a great place to take them. I mean, you know, get to see Major League Baseball, which is crazy. And uh, yeah, no, I just, I think it was, I think it was an essential move uh, from a money standpoint. And I understand. I mean, you know, most of the people complain are like, from New York and Chicago, oh, I can't believe you built it there. But here, I lived all my life down in this area, and I, and I, I relished it. I didn't care where they put it. I just said, let's get Major League Baseball here. 
Well, I know that Jeffrey Loria, obviously, you know, the previous owner of the Marlins, wanted it there. It, but do you think he tried to go other places, or do you feel that was his only option in an effort to try to keep Major League Baseball? Because I still wonder, and again, I wonder whether or not this area can support Major League Baseball. It's a great stadium. I've been there yeah. several times. I love going there. Yeah. I'm very comfortable. They treat me well. Yeah. But, you know, I, I also feel that from a Major League Baseball standpoint, you really want it to do well. I know the product on the field has a, a lot to do with it, too. Yeah, well, that's true. But even when they were winning, uh, you know, they would show up for the big series or they show up for playoffs or the World Series. But other than that, like I said, my main question is, it was when they first built that stadium. I said, what are you going to do on a Tuesday night when the Houston Astros, who at the time were terrible, would come in for a three-game series? Right. Well, how many people are you going to get? See, we didn't have any tradition. The St. Louis area, the Detroit area, the Chicago's, the New York's, they all had that tradition. And that's like when you see Miami change their uniforms all the time and this and that and their logos. People in Detroit, people in Chicago say they wouldn't stand for that. Right. I mean, because you're taking away what was pure in their era. You know, once in a while, you know, like St. Louis would wear the, the, the Dizzy Dean uniforms from back in the 40s and Ted Williams and, you know, in Boston and all this stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, it's just never been a pure baseball atmosphere. It's, it's uh, you know, I mean, but... The fact that you have a lot of uh, uh, baseball players that come from this area, you have a lot of Latins who move in from the Dominican Republic and Cuba and such, so it makes it, it makes it different. I think the one thing that would probably help the Marlins ran a little if there was a retired number or two, maybe Jeff Conine might be a candidate for that. Yeah. I know Don Manningly was nothing but good to the area. Derek Jeter tried. Yeah. But you know, I mean where do you where do you figure that at this point in time where the franchise stands now? <laughs> Not in a very good place. I mean, because I mean, you have a you have a, one superstar who just won the Cy Young, Sandy Alcantara, but you have really nothing else. You ever because every time you get a Giancarlo Stanton, or any time you got a, you know one of these guys like a Cabrera, who we even knew that when he left and went to the Tigers, he would be a freaking Hall of Fame. Right. But they didn't hold on to him. Uh, you know, they didn't hold on to a bunch of guys like Hoffman, Trevor Hoffman, who. Left here, went to the San Diego Padres, became one of the best relievers of all time. And it's because nobody's willing to. All your owners are, are on, on a marginal financial deal. I mean, Heisinger's had a little bit more money, and they spent the, when they owned it. But you know, yeah, you're, until you get an owner who's just like a like a what's his name that just bought Twitter, and, um, Elon, Musk. Elon Musk. If you get a guy like that. And said he owns it, he'll open up his pocket. He'll get you those Aaron judges. He'll get you all those guys, and then you'll see more. But Miami's got most of the people don't know Scott. You know when they talk about JJ Boudet or this guy, they don't know who these guys are. Right. So they have no identity. Uh, the only identity they have is with Sandy Alcantara. And you know, I mean, and to me, just as a baseball purist and as somebody who wants to see the Marlins do well, I would trade him to Sandy Alcantara right now. You pick up three, four. Uh, you, see, because people don't realize, you know how good Houston is now? They were horrible for 25 years. I mean, they were horrible. Right. So they would get their first-round draft picks and everybody else's first-round draft picks, and, and they flourished. The Atlanta Braves the same way. All those years, the Braves would, you know, they when they, when they got mad and they, you know, from Chicago Richard, and a couple Richard, of others. So, yeah, one, two. All right, so when we talk about the Miami Hurricanes, I know I covered them in 82 through 84. I'm yeah. back here again. This year, and of course, I've always followed the program from a distance. Talk about the Hurricanes fans in general. I know that they've won five national championships, good times here, and they've been through a few coaches lately. Where do the Miami Hurricanes stand? Well, not only with their proud history of producing a lot of great players, but where we're at now, from Al Schnellenberger all the way to Mario Cristobal. Well, it's been 20 something years since they were relevant when you really look at it. So. Right. That, that's one of the things. Uh, I think by bringing Mario Cristobal in, you bring somebody who has the heartbeat of the, of the community, he's played here, he's coached here. I think that's this is somebody who is generally, every time he has to come into a, a press conference these days, is hurting because he knows none of this is his fault. I mean, he just inherited a roster that was horrible. And I think over the next three years, and you asked me about Hurricane Fair, uh, 
take them or leave them because they're the fair weather people. They always will jump on the bandwagon, Scott, when things are going good. But when things are going bad, they start pointing fingers. Right. And I, right now, I do two hurricane podcasts. I do a radio show every week, and I have to face this music all the time. Right. People, but I always put it in this context. I think that you're in a different regime now with a different, uh, you know, I love Mark Rick, good, good guy, but he was really on the tail end of his right. career. You get a guy, like Al Gold, he had no identity with this area. You get Manny Diaz, he had never been a head coach in his whole life. You got Mario Cristobal, who's <clears throat> not only been a head coach at Oregon and FIU, but he worked under Greg Schiano at Rutgers, he worked under uh, Nick Saban at uh, Alabama, uh, and here's a guy, if you remember, he gave FIU their first bowl win in Detroit. Right. right at the Little Caesars Bowl. So, uh, to answer your question, I think that Miami's on the upswing. I think that over the next two, three years, you're going to see that team, whether they get, you know what, who's to say, if, you know, if you go, oh, they'll never be a Final Four team. Well, I remember when I was a kid, TCU used to be in the bottom 10 all the time. Right. And look at them. They're on the verge of being a Final Four team. Like Cincinnati. Miami used to routinely beat them like 49 nothing. They were last year. So I think that things can turn around, especially with the transfer portal the way it is. Right. I think the transfer portal is going to increase because of the fact that all these guys who are sophomores and juniors that are seeing a lot of these freshmen who never took a damn snap in, in college getting all this money, they're going to want so right. the stakes will raise. I think that you can infuse your team so much just by using transfer portal. Amazingly enough that you say that, because I appear on my fair share of podcasts or anything like that's how I market yeah, the South yeah, Florida yeah, yeah. Tribune. And I've said the same thing. I've given Mario Cristobal a mulligan because I go back to Gene Hackman's favorite line. Let's see what Hannah can tell. Well, now he knows what Hannah can tell. He knew. I think he really knew when he was coming in. But it, it's really tough, Scott. I mean, right. you know, you get in a situation. He wanted this job so bad. He he had opportunities to go other places. He could have stayed at Oregon and been set for life. I mean, you know, I mean, not that he's not now. But, I mean, but he came in here and made immediate changes. He got he got the uh, got everybody to, to, to buy into this situation. Not only that, he hired. Brought in some major, major coach, assistant coaches, and he's going to do upgrades to the facilities. Which, you know, to me, when I was younger and we started in this game, I think facilities were overblown because when Miami and USC were dominating football, they had two of the worst facilities ever, uh, you know, to work out playing in. You know, you play in the Coliseum, you play in the Orange Bowl, those are two historic places. But as far as on-campus facilities, you couldn't keep up with the Michigans, and you couldn't keep up with the Ohio States and the Alabamas because you just remember a lot of these schools are, are public, are state schools. Right. I'm mean, private school, so that that to me, you have to do a lot of fundraising, and uh, you know, not that you don't have to at state schools, but at least you get some help from the state to help you. And when you fund a multi-million dollar new facility that Miami's going to get on campus, which will benefit everybody. All their sports right now, they hired uh, an athletic director who gets it and who has built so many good things at, at Clemson. And now you look at the entire sports program. Both basketball teams are doing well, the volleyball team's doing well, right. the baseball team's always done well. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, I I think that you're going to see them add over the next couple of years, they're going to add women's softball, they're going to add wrestling for the, for the men because Miami wants to keep on par. And the rest of the ACC has that. And, uh, you know, all these teams like Virginia Tech and Duke and, you know, people always knock Duke and Virginia. But if you look outside of football, and this year Duke is doing real well, they own the ACC. Right. And soccer, lacrosse, baseball, softball. Virginia's been uh, national champion not right. many times. So Miami needs to, they're in that mode where they're going to try to keep up, uh, you know, from coast to coast and I think they'll do well. All right, so when we look at the South Florida sports market in general, when I was here back in the 80s, you had the Panthers, you didn't even have the Heat, of course. We knew about the Marlins and you had the Fort Lauderdale Strikers. So give me your thoughts about the addition of the Miami Heat and the Florida Panthers. And of course you have Miami Homestead Speedway, which I've right. had a lot of fun yeah. with lately. But you know, how much of a good addition had there been? Uh, to me, it doesn't seem like there's a genuine amount of interest in the NHL here. And Miami Heat have done, they won three championships. So yeah. I can't say anything bad about it. But compare and contrast the Panthers and the Heat. Well, look at management. See, when you look at the Heat management and Pat Riley and all these people, the Aronson family, that's, that's what makes all the difference right. in the world. Because like I said, 
you get an Elon Musk or somebody with a lot of money to do the, and he could turn around and hire somebody really, really good, like the Dave Dombrowski's in this world, who's been successful at every turn. Detroit, Miami, now up in uh, where he's at now and doing a great, tremendous job. So I think that that's what it's all about. You gotta, you gotta have a good uh, base. And if you don't have a good base, you're gonna fall behind. And I, I think that, you know, the Panthers have done okay. You know, I mean, they're starting to win. They're getting good players, and but they had to get good players. You know, I mean, they, and, and their facility is real nice. They're centrally located, but they're not centrally located today. So, to to your point before about uh, the aren't you know that Orange Bowl area being so far removed from Palm Beach County, right. well, is isn't the arena where the Panthers play uh, far removed from Miami Dade? It is. It's uh, almost an hour. So it's uh, and that's sure. and then you're talking three four million people who live in that area that you're losing out. So the sword is double edged on both sides. So it's it's uh, you know you. You know, and that's just the way it is. It is. But I, to answer your question, I think, the, you know, being a four-sport, uh, major four-sport town is great. I mean, where the, you know, uh, Orlando's not, uh, Tampa Bay falls short with a, with a uh, basketball team. So we're a four-sport major uh, team plus a soccer program. Right. And, um, so I think that that makes a difference. And I, I think that uh, it's just you have to have the ownership that means everything. If you don't have good ownership, then you're not. Well, I think in the Panthers' case, they have a great location in Broward County. Yeah, but, but you're losing out well, on, a, like well, what I said, three, four million people who live in South Miami all the way up, you know, to the, the, to the county line. Uh, you know, I mean, not to say they don't ever go, but they're going to go, but they're not going to go three times a week. They'll go once a week, once a month, you know, like I said. Uh, you know, in the Miami Arena is the same thing or whatever it's called. I know it's not called FTX because they're not. Yeah, no, they got wiped out. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, same thing there. But the Heat are more of an event, right. you know, and people go there it's because there's superstars there Mike all the time. They have, you know, it's, it's a good place to be seen. Well, in the, in the situation one, with Mike the check. Panthers, one, so. Two. Mike check. Testing one, two. Yeah, we have a mic check just like that over there. That's why we're here on location, <laughs> folks. But in the Panthers' case, too, one, winning one playoff series in 30 years doesn't help yeah, navigate no. the interest. And we all know that South Florida is winner you don't support. So I'm not right. knocking the Panthers. I only go by where the facts yeah, lead no, me. And, of course, the Miami Dolphins, well, you know, they're get, they've gone through a lot of coaches, but they're certainly got a pretty good history. Where do you think the Dolphins stand at this particular point? Well, you know what? I mean, uh, I can't, you know, the ownership right now is on a hiatus because of, uh, you know, some things that he got caught doing, but he has money. And he put it, he, he, the one thing that I've said, he's always tried to get those free agents. Now he's got a man, uh, Chris Guerrero, is turning his whole world around, be, you know, coming up and, and striking gold with Tua. You know, I mean, uh, Tua's a guy that everybody said, let's give him time, but you put nobody around him. Now they got two of the best wide receivers in the, in the NFL, and they got a great running game, and you know, offensive lines improving. Their defense is really stellar. So I think as long as your management, you know, lets the football people run it. See, the one thing with White ha Wayne Heinzinga did is he just thought, you know, Bill Parcells would be good, but Bill was way over his head. Right. You know, it was he wasn't. He was so past his time. Everyone was just looking at him when he was a big tuna and doing all this stuff in New York. But he was he all he did was waste time and he wasted money. So that was it. All right, so when we talk about South Florida's sports, and we all know you know you want to don't support that's a reputation. Yeah. Well, it's always been like that. It's an event town. Like yeah, said, right. Uh, but you know, but you know, you, you you've been here long enough to to understand the landscape. So yeah. and like you said, you do your podcast and you get feedback and but that's where we're at. But, uh, you know, it's just like you know, like tonight. I mean, you got a game with the University of Pittsburgh, um, uh, kind of a survival game for Miami. But you know, a lot of fans would much rather not see them tonight because it's just it's it's delaying the ebb. Get on with the off season. Let the people who are going to leave leave, and there's going to be a lot of them that are going to leave. Restock your roster, whether it be with your class, upcoming class, and uh, but to me. People who say that don't think because first of all, you got a senior class who's in dirt crap here. <laughs> to right. be honest with you, right? So right. they deserve to go. You know, I mean, some of the other people who haven't bought in, not so much. But uh, yeah, that's it. Um, and 
I'm excited about you know just every you know having the opportunity to come to the Hurricane Games. Like you said, I've come to the Hurricane Games since the early '60s, so I've watched the transformation. I've, I've worked um, back in the day when they were crushing people, and uh, and then I've worked it during the time when they were getting crushed. So it's uh, what goes around comes around. And that's it. Couple more questions here. I, I know that I wrote something today leading up to this game. Back in 1982, Jim Kelly gets hurt, Mark Rickey and then Kyle Vander win. This year we've seen a little bit of a parallel. Yeah. Tyler Van Dyke on to Jake Garcia and I guess it was it? Jakari Brown. Jakari yeah. Brown. So, you know, those things happen. And again, I've said I give Mario Cristobal at least a moment in this year. Yeah. And I think it'll take two or three years. So let's talk about Larry Bluestein's business, per se. I know that you provide a lot of information right. about high school players. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, what I've been doing is I do recruiting and uh, for football, and I see games live. I don't, I'm not a, like I said earlier, I'm not a person who can sit home and watch film because everybody can do that. So uh, everything based in recruiting is on character, uh, the way they act when they're at the games, which you can't see from film. So I go to a lot of the games. I go to camps year-round. I mean, we're talking this last year. I went to all colleges in the state of Florida. And when I say all colleges, from West Florida University to all the majors like Florida, Florida State, Miami, UCF, USF, FAU, FIU, plus the NAI schools like Kaiser and Florida Memorial. And I went to all those places, Weber, Warner, uh, Southeastern University, because of the fact that I wanted to go to their camps. I wanted to, because unlike a lot of people who want to look for the five-star guys, colleges know about it. It's the kids who are not star-rated kids that you can say, hey, well, I found this guy or I found that guy. And you can't do that at home. And that's what I do. And the colleges, you know, uh, you know uh, subscribe to my services. And I send them, you know, every day, every day of the year, 365 days, even Thanksgiving I was working. You know? yeah. So, uh, but that's what I do. And I enjoy it. Um, you know, like I said, we've got two podcasts going one, uh, both of them hurricane related. Six Ring Kang, which is every Monday night, which I love, and also the uh, our, my radio show every week. It's uh, going on its 15th straight year in a large market, and that's the one thing people don't realize, Scott. A high school sports show year-round in a, in a larger market is, is unheard of, and every program director that comes into the radio station, whether they're from New York or Pittsburgh or Boston, and they're like, nah, that ain't, but then they see the numbers, and they see the interest, and Changes their mind. You know, amazes me. You, you have such a great service, which to me, the two words that stand out are hidden gems. Yeah. And that seems like you're building your model on the hidden gems. Now, do you do this by yourself, or do you have a pretty good staff of people that work for you? Or is it, you're looking at the staff, Scott. No kidding. Yeah. So I can relate to a guy who's, you know, outside of Candy Evelyn, who does an unbelievable job on the controlling side, where I'm like you. We're both doing it all on our own. Our arms are getting tired. Oh, I know. We get, yeah, I mean, we just go ballistically nuts. So as the media has changed over the years, when we worked at the Digest, God rest in peace, Peter Bluston, one of my favorite mentors of all time. I love Peter. I know you probably have nothing but good things to say about him. But when we think about where we both have gone from terrestrial radio to podcasting, what are your thoughts about this new media when we talk about podcasting? I, to me, it's easy to prepare for a show, but the difficulties is not only trying to find sponsors, but how you get that message to other people. But tell me what your thoughts about what media is in 2022, 23, what we call new media. Well, you're keeping up with the times. Yeah. Obviously, the times dictate that. The days of the newspapers, which I spent almost 40 years in the newspaper right. business, you hate to see it. Uh, decline like that because there's nothing like a physical publication you know it's, a, it's tough to show grandparents uh, your kids and stuff like that on a computer if they don't have a computer but you have it in a newspaper you keep it for the rest of your lives I, I, I that's another thing what I do I'm a huge sports collector I have almost 5,000 programs uh, from baseball to football <laughs> World <laughs> Series uh, um, uh, Super Bowls I have the entire Dolphins programs from the first year of 66 all the way to 79. Uh, and, and I keep that stuff. So that's one of my passions. And people, you know, I'm not, you know, people could call me old school, but I'm right up with them. I have every electronic possible. I'm on everything from uh, Twitter to Instagram to Facebook to everything there is. So I've kept up with the times. To answer your question, you got to keep up with the times. And that's, that's what we are at right now. Sure, I could be a 
stubborn old guy and say, you know what, I'm going to use this newspaper. And the newspapers have gone digital now, and right. we have to face that. Well, I mean, let's face it, I, I'm a memorabilia collector too. And I don't have to divulge how many I have, but I have a fair amount yeah, of sure. a collection. You know, after 40 years, you're going to grab an item or two. But I guess you're right. We have to keep up with the time. But what are your thoughts about podcasting in general? It's the medium right now. And so where everybody's getting an opportunity to hear your what your opinions are. And there are more people, because you could download them and run. You right. could download them and put them in your car. You could download them and just, you know, have them. And uh, that's the one positive. It's uh, you got very a lot of different avenues to, to uh, spread the word, and I think it's important. You ever have a chance to cover any Super Bowls in person? Yeah, five. Of them. Oh, have you? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I've been to eleven World Series, and uh, I've been to a lot of things. Uh, and I've been very fortunate to do these things. And you know, I mean, as somebody who deals with high school kids and has dealt with high school kids all my life, for them to know, I mean, a lot of them I never tell because I'm not the story. There's a lot of people in the industry that want to make themselves, like a lot of media people want to make themselves the story. I'm not the story. You know, I mean, and it, it, and when people come up to me and, hey, you know, can I get your picture? I'm embarrassed because that's not me. I'm not that. But most people relish it. There's a lot of people in the media that actually work to get that notoriety. I don't want that. I just, because it's never been about me, Scott. Right. I never have. Not one time and it'll never be. And, uh, you know, I mean, like, people will come to games with me, and like, you know, a hurricane game, and we'll walk in from the car, and it'll take me 40 minutes, because everyone will come, hey, you want to, can I get your picture, and, and it's uncomfortable, but, you know, one of the mothers said to me a couple of weeks ago, when I said, hey, really, and she goes, you know, you don't understand what it means, my son watches you and what you do, and he really loves what you do, and it, you, you mean a lot to these kids, so, you know, I understand. I mean, you know, that, that way, you know, I tell my wife the same thing. She says, you just, you know, you've never been that type of guy. And I'm not. I'm not that type of guy. You know, I mean, I don't want to be that person who's so big that you can't go to Publix. Or you can't go to, without anybody bothering you. I don't want to be that, you know. And, and uh, you know, and that's, you know, that's why I go early in Publix, just in case, you know, so. <laughs> that's funny. That's the way you've always been anyways. I, I find one of the most interesting part of, about today's new media, whether we like it or not, you and I are radio, old yeah, school radio yeah, guys, yeah. but now we're visual because now there's cameras in front of us. Anyhow, do you, do you like the fact that at times the camera's on you or no. do you really care? Would you, no. I, or I wish we would have, <laughs> only with you, person, yeah, me either, uh, I, I would do it on radio, yeah, but this is just a, too much, so. oh, this is a great memory with the two of us being yeah, old buddies yeah, here. Well, I appreciate it. But, yeah, but yeah. tell me your biggest thrill finally as we wrap this thing up here. How about what you've done in sports, what you've earned out of it, the biggest rewards you've had? Well, the biggest uh, thing I ever had was uh, getting a chance to solo interview Muhammad Ali at the Fifth Street Gym um, when I was 19 years old. And that was only because my classmate, uh, Jimmy Dundee, whose uh, yeah, relatives, uh, and I, I said to him, he says, hey, would you like to interview uh, Cassius Clay at the time? And <clears throat> I said, oh, yeah, you're kidding me. He goes, well, I'll let you know. And he calls me up. He goes, uh, my uncle said, uh, come on over tomorrow, 1.30 over Fifth Street Gym. And uh, the man gave me an hour and 20 minutes. And I used it on my radio show. I used it, it was, it, to this day, and I've had an opportunity to, uh, you know, meet some of the biggest stars, uh, you know, especially like Bob Feller and people like that. And, Gosh. you know, some of the big people. But uh, Muhammad Ali it was the biggest thrill in my life because just he was bigger than life. You know, and, and, right. and I got a chance to meet uh, his daughter, Layla maybe about 20 years ago and I told the story and she had tears going down her eyes and and uh, you know and, and it's weird because Muhammad's grandson um, uh, one of them is an MMA boxing fighter now right. and the other one was playing football in fact he played at the UCLA and the University of Nevada Las Vegas for a while so uh, yeah that, that was that's been my biggest thing. Amazingly enough another similarity folks okay at the Hallandale Digest I had an opportunity to interview Muhammad Ali yeah. at the old Allen Park Gym. Remember yes, that? Yes, yes, yes. I did yes. that. Sugar Ray Leonard was there. Angelo <coughs> Dundee, good friend of mine at the time. And I got to know him real well. And you're right. I, uh, Muhammad Ali is iconic to yeah, me. Yet true. another similarity between Larry Bluestein and me. Now, of course, I'm wearing blue because of you anyway, so that way there's a little bit of color significance to it. That was probably one of the reasons why I had the blue related to it. Ah, whatever. 
Does anybody care? Maybe if they do, if they're watching this whole thing. This is Fire Up, Florida. My name is Scott Morgan Roth. Motor City Man, that's where I'm from, Rosie. I live here in the South Florida. I have too much money invested in the <laughs> trademark to change it any other way, so I gotta stick with the Motor City. I appreciate theme, it. But I'm pleased to be joined by Larry Bluestein, my longtime colleague, friend, and so forth. What a great day here today. I've been always look, I've been looking forward to an opportunity to do this show with you, and there's no matter time. I know I look forward to inviting you 108 Sitches Baseball Talk yeah. sometime down yeah. the line. But meanwhile, this is a great start. The Miami Hurricanes and two guys that really have gone back. And, you know, I, I've had a lot of great memories in my 43 years in the business. But I think the biggest memory that I have as we wrap the show up is not only with the events that you cover, Larry, but the people that you meet along the journey. Yeah. And again, associating you, Sonny Hirsch. And stuff. Right, Sonny Hirsch, working yeah, with Don yeah, Chulo with yeah. the Digest. And I think that's it. We both can appreciate the memories of people and the friends you make. And I think that that's probably the one thing I could say that you and I have a great history. And I hope a lot of people, when they go ahead and look at what this interview, and please subscribe to the South Florida Tribune YouTube channel, also on Twitter at Tribune South Gets It Done, and go to our website www.southfloridatribune.com. You can see a lot of this, but Larry, I tell you what, thanks, Scotty. a lifelong friend, brother, Appreciate thank you very much for being on Fire Up Florida, Great and time. until the next time, meanwhile, Larry, happy Thanksgiving, and thank look forward to more shows with you. Thank Appreciate you, buddy. You. Thanks.